Hello and welcome to this section on logistic regression. This will be our first look at a classification algorithm or a machine learning algorithm that is used to solve classification problems. And, you know, first example for classification models is always logistic regression. You know, it's generally taught right after linear regression. Linear regression being the traditional example for the simplest regression algorithm or the reg uh, regression model. So logistic regression generally follows and after logistic regression, all the subsequent algorithms are or models are generally either, you know, for regression or classification or can be used for both. But they're often just more complicated and they work in different ways and it might not be as common. But linear regression and logistic regression should always you know every data scientist every machine learning expert should at least know these two models now don't get confused with the name uh, just because you know there's regression in the name don't assume this to be a model used for solving regression problems right where it's going to be a classification model and the problems we're going to be solving using logistic regression are classification problems now when you go into the details and the technical definitions and you know what's going on in the background mathematically and statistics wise you know i'm sure there's a very good explanation for why this is called regression but you know for our sake don't get confused logistic regression is for classification whereas linear regression is for regression so let's go ahead and define classification we define this in the introduction to machine learning section but since we're finally getting our hands dirty with some actual classification, let's define it again. So classification is where you predict a class from a given instance based on a set of features. So, you know, an example would be being able to predict whether an email is spam or not, right? It's either spam or it's not. There's no continuous variable. You know, it's just a binary zero or one, true or false, spam or not. So that's a very classical example of a classification problem. Another would be, you know, a more complex classification problem where you have a larger set of, of possibilities or a larger set of classes would be, you know, predicting whether a handwritten digit corresponds to 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, right? So you have a total of 10 classes. You know for sure that you have a collection of handwritten digits and, you know, there's no chance of it being a letter or something else. There are only 10 possibilities corresponding to the 10 numbers. So this is also a classification problem, but it's more complex. It's a multi-class problem. You're trying to predict more than one class, but it's still classification. It's not a continuous variable that you're trying to predict, and therefore it can't be a regression model that's going to be used to solve the problem. Now, primarily, you know, we're concerned with binary classification, which is you know, this example here, where you classify an instance into one of two possible classes. So, you know, for example, either it's email or either it's spam or not spam, right? So generally, binary classification will help you solve most classification problems. And once you understand binary classification, it's not really that hard to scale it up into multi-class classification, though it is not often directly applicable, but there are ways in which you can actually use binary classification approaches to solve multi classification problems. So I'm not going to go into that because that's a more advanced topic, but I might make mention of it towards the end of this video. But essentially, if you assume that essentially you can build 10 different classifiers and each one would predict whether the digit is a number or not. So the first classifier would predict whether the handwritten digit is a zero or not. So not would mean it could be any one of the other numbers. And then you'd build another classifier, which would predict if the handwritten digit is a one or not, and so on and so forth. So you can convert binary classification approaches into multi class classification solutions. So but that's, you know, a more advanced topic. And I'm just mentioning that to kind of convey to you the fact that, you know, if you as long as you master binary classification, you shouldn't have that much trouble when you do encounter a multi-classification problem, you know, 
it wouldn't be too difficult for you to figure out what you, what you have to do or at least to read the relevant literature and try to understand from there. So like I just mentioned, multi-class classification, you classify an instance into one or more than two possible classes. So in the example that we gave with the digits, that would be a multi-class classification problem. There are also multi-label classification models, you know, they're called binary labels, and also multi-output or multi-class labels. But those are more advanced topics. Again, a majority of the time, just a simple understanding of binary classification suffices. And if not, multi-class classification. But these are there for reference if you want to look them up and learn about them as well. So one of the most important and most fundamental metrics or you know performance measures, if you will, for classification problems is accuracy. Now, there are a lot of performance measurements that we're going to be learning about and they're all important for you to be able to correctly interpret the results of your classification model and so it's important that you pay attention to what the exact definitions of these are you know when we're speaking english and we when you know we say that something's accurate you know we have an understanding of what accurate means but technically you know when you're talking about it in terms of classification accuracy might not always reflect on how on whether or not the model is actually good or not okay so you know you might have a high accuracy but the model with that accuracy that you, you know you have might not be the best model or or not even a good model for your problem so accuracy is just one measurement and there are other measurements that you know in english we might also refer to as accurate but technically you know they measure other performance aspects of a model so Keep that in mind, and that's going to make more sense as we learn about the other performance measures as well. But let's start with accuracy. So accuracy basically measures the number of correct predictions over the total number of predictions. So, you know, let's say you have 100 predictions and how many of those predictions are correct. OK, that is accuracy, technically speaking. That is the definition of accuracy as far as we're concerned. So it's a metric commonly used for evaluating or measuring the performance of classification models, as I've said, and it measures the percentages of cases that are correctly classified. Now, it's not very easy to evaluate a classifier just based on one performance measure like accuracy. If you remember from linear regression, it was pretty easy. You know, we had the R squared value, we had the P values you know, we could plot the result and we could see it visually and, and that kind of stuff. So regression models are generally easier to classify or easier to evaluate, but classifiers are a little bit more difficult and therefore we're going to have to define, a, you know, a few more performance measurements and, you know, refer back to them often. So it can be a misleading metric. Accuracy can be a misleading metric and it does not alone tell the full story. So keep that in mind. And this is a good example of why, because, you know, you might be wondering why, right? How can a model have high accuracy, but not be a good classifier? Um, and this is a very good example of that. I love this example. This is an example that I actually took from, you know, back in college when I was actually first learning machine learning. This was the example that the professor gave us. And, and that's when it really, you know, sunk in. And, you know, I've carried this example with me since then. So this one and, and another one I'm going to show you in a little bit to explain the difference, essentially the two different types of classifiers that you might ever want to build and the things to watch out for. So for this one, so imagine you're building a classifier to predict whether a patient has a rare fatal disease like cancer. Okay. So the keyword here is it's rare and it's fatal. Now assume that 0.1% of the population is affected by the disease. And, you know, because it's rare. So the if you want to build a classifier, let's assume that the positive class you're assigning to patients that have the disease or are found to have cancer. And the negative class you're assigning to patients who don't have the disease. Okay. So you want to predict, you want a classifier that can correctly identify positive and negative classes within a population. And so this is obviously a binary classification problem because you have two classes, you know, it's either positive or negative, you know, there's, they either have cancer or they don't. Now, if the model always predicts that the patient does not have 
the disease. Okay, so it always predicts the negative class. Whatever you throw at it, it always tells you that, you know, my prediction is that, you know, this, you know, is the negative class, right? Regardless of test results, right? It will be right 99.9% .9 of the time. Why? Because only 0.1% of the population actually has cancer. So it'll be wrong only 0.1% of the time because it'll also predict you know, the 0.1% of the population that, that has cancer, um, it will also predict them to be the negative class or patients that don't have the disease, okay? So essentially the classification accuracy would be 99.9%. .9%. So even though the accuracy is extremely high, the model is essentially useless, right? Because the critical part, you know, the critical prediction where it's it's important for you to predict accurately is uh, or correctly is the 0.1 percent of the time right you want to identify those who have cancer that's what's important here in this problem but you're identifying a hundred percent of these people incorrectly so model is rubbish right you know there's nothing you can do with it it has no use whatsoever so we need other metrics to evaluate the performance of classifiers okay so this example is, you know, is used to emphasize the importance of what I stated in the beginning where, you know, you have to use these other metrics and accuracy on its own is not enough. Now, I'm going to also be sharing with you another example like this, again, from back when I was learning this in college, which will also show you another problem, another case in which the other performance metric is not enough on its own. Okay. So that's why you have to use a lot of these in conjunction with one another to actually interpret, the, evaluate the effectiveness of your model correctly. We need to define something called a confusion matrix so that we can actually define those other performance measures or to better understand the definitions of those other performance measures that we're going to be learning about. So um, a confusion matrix is essentially a table where the rows represent actual classes, as you can see here. So these are actual classes. So whether or not the, uh, you know, let's assume, for example, we're talking about the same problem with the cancer, that whether or not the patient actually does have cancer or not. Okay, so that's what the rows represent. And the columns represent the predicted classes. So these are the results or the predictions of our classifier. And each entry is the number of instances with the corresponding actual and predicted classes. So, for example, this cell here or this entry here, TP, stands for true positive. So this would represent the percentage or the number, I'm sorry, of instances where the patient actually had cancer and the classifier predicted it correctly. So this is very good. This is what we want, right? We want a high number here. We want a high true positive rate because you know this is very good correct prediction now this would be the false positive number here so this would mean or actually before we go into that let's just go into to this as well. so these two are correct classifications meaning that so this one patient had cancer and it was predicted that he had cancer so that's good right and also here the patient didn't have cancer and our classifier said correct uh, or our classifier predicted it correctly as no cancer in that patient. So this is a true negative number here or the true negative rate. So that means it's true that it's neg like the negative was predicted, predicted truly or correctly and the positive was corrected, predicted truly or correctly. So these two, ideally, all the numbers here, you know, everything else should be zero and these should should have all the numbers, all the counts. Because ideally, you want a classifier that can correctly predict the yes and the no class correctly, right? But in some problems, it's a little bit more crucial that, you know, this is high. And it doesn't matter if this is high or not that much. Because it's okay if we, you know, if somebody doesn't have cancer and, and your classifier predicts them to have cancer. That's not so bad, right? In some follow-up, you know, checkups and that kind of stuff they're going to realize that he doesn't have cancer and, you know, there's no harm to anybody except maybe some time lost or some money lost on the checkups, but that's it. But you do not want to falsely classify somebody who does have cancer as not having cancer. So that would be the false negative. So the negative prediction is false, is incorrectly predicted. So 
the patient does have cancer, but it was predicted that he doesn't have cancer, which is very bad. We want this to be zero, ideally. And then here, this, it doesn't matter if it's zero or not. I, you know, ideally it would be zero, but it doesn't really hurt anybody if it's not. And that's that, that the patient doesn't have cancer, but our classifier predicts that they do have cancer. So it's uh, very important that you understand this confusion matrix as it's very important in helping you correctly interpret or evaluate the performance of your classifier. It's very, very important. And again, it's going to all depend on the problem you're trying to solve. You know, in the case of the cancer problem, right, you know, you know very clearly that it's crucial that this is zero and that this is high and it's okay if this is not zero or this is not zero, right? So that might change depending on your problem as we're going to see in some of the following slides. So this is a very important and this itself actually is a performance measure. The performance measures we're going to learn in the next slides are going to be like accuracy. It's just going to be like a number that's going to give you information, right? A summary. It's just a single number. But this, you know, is not a single metric, but it's still something that you can use to interpret your or evaluate the performance of your model. So whenever you, you do solve a classification problem or you build a classification model, uh, definitely, you know, print out the confusion me metrics and try to understand what's going on with the classifier and where its strengths and weaknesses lie. So accuracy we defined earlier as the number of correct predictions from all the predictions, right? So essentially what that means is if we use the confusion matrix, it would mean TP plus TN. Why? Because, T, you know, we said that accuracy is the number of correct predictions from all the predictions. So the number of correct predictions are TP and TN. Remember? Correctly, yes. And it's correctly classified, predicted as yes. No one's correctly predicted as no. So TP and TN are the total count or the total correct predictions. So we add them up, TP plus TN, over, we add everything else up together. So all everything, all of this added up together is the total number of predictions because here we are counting our predictions. So, you know, TP plus TN plus FP plus FN is the total number of predictions that we've done or we've conducted. So TP plus TN over FT, FP plus FN plus TP plus TN would correspond to our accuracy metric. And it is essentially answering the question of how often is the classifier correct? That's it. How often is the classifier correct? And it doesn't go into details as to what type of correct it is. Now, for that, we would need precision and recall. So after accuracy, precision and recall are probably the two most important metrics, or I guess that's open to interpretation, but precision and recall are very important and for classification. So precision corresponds to TP over TP plus FP. Okay, so you have to spend some time thinking about this and why it's different from accuracy. Okay, so in this case, we're answering the question of when predicted positive, right? That's why we're adding TP plus FP, TP plus FP. So when the positive case has been predicted, so when, yes, the patient does have cancer is the result of our classifier, okay? How often is the classifier correct? So that's precision, right? So whenever our classifier predicts yes, sometimes it's incorrect and sometimes it's correct. So that means that sometimes the patient actually doesn't have cancer, but our classifier says it, he does have cancer. But other times, you know, the patient does have cancer and we do correctly predict that. So when we're measuring precision, we're measuring how many of the times that our classifier predicted a positive class is our classifier actually correct or was the a patient that had cancer. Okay. So that's precision. And, you know, I want you to like maybe pause this video and, and spend time thinking about, you know, the difference between these two. So these two, you know, in English, when we're just speaking English, right, and we, we don't know anything about machine learning, we might refer to both of these accuracy, right? So something that has a high precision, you know, in machine learning, we might just be like, oh, it's a very accurate model. And this is also very accurate, but they have very different definitions and they measure two very important different things, right? And the same thing with recall. In the case of recall, this time it's TP over TP plus FN. So we're answering the question, how often are the positive instances classified correctly as positive? So TP plus FN, 
these refer to all the patients that actually do in real life they have cancer but some of them we might have predicted as not having cancer even though they do have cancer so we want to know out of all the patients of the 0.1 percent of the population that does have cancer how many times among them have we been able to successfully predict as having cancer so this is the important measurement for this particular problem we want a high recall ideally a recall of of one like 100 percent, right because we don't want to ever predict that somebody that actually doesn't have cancer right because then they'll just continue living in their life not knowing that they need treatment and then they'll die right and so we want to prevent that so for that particular problem recall is important but notice that again takes take your time to really understand go back to the confusion matrix and like really understand the difference between precision and recall and these questions right that we're trying to answer with each and understand it very well and how it corresponds to different contexts or different problems because in some problems and i'm going to give you examples of this in the following slides but some problems need a high precision as opposed to a high recall they don't care about the recall being high or some they want a high recall like in our case we don't care about the precision being high we don't care about the positively predicted classes are always correctly predicted as positive because we don't care about falsely diagnosing somebody who doesn't have cancer with cancer but we do care about falsely diagnosing somebody who doesn't have cancer as not having cancer okay so I'm not sure if I said that correctly, so I'm going to repeat myself. We don't care about falsely diagnosing somebody who doesn't have cancer with cancer, right? Because that's relatively harmless. But we do care about diagnosing somebody who does have cancer as not having cancer, because that could potentially be fatal. So that's the importance between precision and recall, and there is a trade-off between them. So as recall increases precision does decrease and as precision increases recall does decrease so that's why it's very important for you to know based on the, your problem for you to to understand and realize which of these metrics you're trying to maximize now there's a very useful metric called the f1 score that combines precision and recall into a single metric and this is the formula for it so essentially you know it's two over one over preci precision plus one over recall or in other words two times precision times recall over precision plus recall so this aims to combine both of them into a single number into a single metric so you don't have to calculate both precision and recall or you don't have to think about both of them in a majority of the problems where it's not really critical like the cancer problem where you have a very high value for one or the other so generally you want to have a high value for both, right? A model that has a high precision and high recall is generally better. Um, aside from those edge cases, like the cancer uh, problem, that's generally what you want to aim for. So it's essentially a weighted average of precision and recall, and it gives you a value between zero and one. So zero would be a terrible uh, value for the metric, so a terrible model, and one would ideally be the best model based on this metric the f1 score so it's it'll only be high if both recall and precision are high and it favors classifiers that have similar precision and recall so that's why it's, it's particularly useful again in those problems where it's not really that important for you to maximize one of them and the f1 score favors classifiers that have similar precision and recall but this is not always what you want okay again it's very important to understand your problem sometimes precision is more important sometimes recall is more important and here's a very quick example of how the f1 score prefers models that have similar precision and recall scores as opposed to having a, a wide difference between them so for example this model has a precision of 0.5 you know which is not bad but it's not particularly good it's just in the middle and it has also a recall of 0.5 but since they're both similar right they're, they're both the same at the same level the f1 score is, is 0 0.5 whereas a model might have very high precision which is very good for you know if that's what you're looking for but it might have very low recall then the f1 score also amounts to being 0 0.5 so you know even though this has a very high precision number precision rate or measurement it has a, the same score as, as the one here so, so this, it's important for you to understand this so that you know when you need f1 
when you need the F1 score, right? If you just care about overall even balanced model, you know, with a similar position and recall, which are both relatively good, and then, you know, F1 is what you're going for. Otherwise, you might just have to focus on looking at precision specifically or recall. So an example of when to prefer pre precision over recall or recall over precision is when you build a classifier that detects videos that are safe for kids. So this is essentially the inverse of the cancer problem. Remember in, in the cancer problem, we said that we want a high recall. We want to always predict correctly the cases or the patients that do actually have cancer. And we don't care about the precision being so high. So this is the opposite or the inverse to when you want to detect videos that are safe for kids, right? Because now you need a classifier that might that may reject good videos, which would correspond to a low recall, but keeps only safe ones, high precision. So remember in the, in the cancer problem, we were okay with predicting non-cancer patients as having cancer. That was relatively safe for us. That mistake, that error is relatively safe for us. In this case, that would correspond to having classified some bad videos as good so the kids would be exposed to bad videos and so that's not what we want in this case we want the other side to be stronger which is we want we're okay with the classifier incorrectly classifying good videos as bad because it's not you know it's harmless for a kid to to miss viewing a particular video that might be good good because it was classified as false falsely as opposed to him viewing a bad video on accident because it was falsely classified as a good video okay so this is very hard to grasp i i completely understand and it took me a while to grasp this as well when i first learned this so please take your time pause the video think about this think about the difference between this classifier or this problem with the the videos and the cancer problem and how they're exact opposites or inverses of one another and how in one, so in this case, precision is more important. You want a high precision and a low recall, or a low recall is okay. And in the cancer problem, you want a high recall and a low precision is okay. So take your time to really understand these two problems. And again, this is the cancer problems or cl classifier that identifies the patients with a rare cancer at an initial screening stage. We need a classifier that detects all patients with this rare cancer. So we want a high recall, you know, basically a one. And then a higher precision is a bonus, you know, because that will reduce the number of follow-up tests, but it's not harmful. It's not going to harm anybody. It's not fatal, right? So these two examples are very important for you to understand. And really understanding them will really give you an edge and, and, and a very solid base for solving classification problems. So there is a precision recall trade-off, as I've mentioned. So um, it's ideal to have both precision and recall to be high, but this is often not possible. So increasing precision, precision reduces recall and vice versa. So this is something to keep in mind. Classification models compute a score or probability for each class. And when the score or probability is greater than a certain threshold, the instance is assigned to the positive case and otherwise it's assigned to the negative case. So by changing this threshold, which is a hyperparameter, remember we talked about hyperparameters. And so this is a hyperparameter, which basically defines the way the model will be set up. So by changing this threshold or by changing how sensitive the model is to assigning an instance to a positive class versus a negative class, we can change the trade-off or, or we can change the precision and recall score. So we can play with the trade-off between precision and recall. If the threshold is raised, right, it becomes more difficult for an instance to be classified as positive. And so this increases the precision, but the recall decreases. Okay. And again, don't hesitate to go back and refer to the confusion matrix to, to make sense of what I'm saying here. Now, if the threshold is lower, it becomes easier for positive for an instance to be classified as a positive class so it becomes easier for the classifier to make the mistake of falsely classifying negative cases as positive and so the precision decreases and the recall increases so this trade-off again goes hand in hand with these two examples that i gave for you to understand the importance of, of what's going on here so you can really understand 
the difference between the different classification problems and know how to approach solving them. So to find the best, you can plot the precision versus the recall for various thresholds. So you can run the model you can you can fit the model using various thresholds and plot the precision and recall and then you can select the threshold that gives the best precision recall trade-off for your classification task or you can plot precision versus recall for various thresholds and select the best precision recall trade-off for a task the closer the precision recall curve to the top right corner the better the classification model because that would mean we're going to see um, in the following examples, but that would correspond to the highest precision and the highest recall value. So now instead of doing all of that, we can use what's called an ROC curve, which basically does that, but it summarizes it in this curve, right? It's called a, you know, nobody really knows this, but it's called the receiver operating characteristic curve. Nobody refers to it as that, right? We always call it the ROC curve. I actually have to look that up while making these slides, but it's another common tool used with binary classifiers and it's similar to the precision versus recall curve so it's essentially giving you the same data but allowing you to view it in a different way and it plots the tpr or the true positive rate against the false positive rate for various thresholds so remember the true positive rate is tp over tp plus fn okay so it's another name for recall or sensitivity and it measures the rate of positive instances correctly classified as positive. And then the FPR rate or the false positive rate is FP over FP plus TN. And it's the rate of negative instances incorrectly classified as positive. Again, go back and refer to the confusion matrix to make sense of this. Now, when we plot these, uh, we get a curve like this. And this essentially gives you a, the trade off, you know, have the higher tpr or recall the more positive uh the, the more false positives you would naturally have okay there's no way around this there is this relationship where as the true positive rate increases the false positive rate will also increase so you essentially want to select the best tpr fpr trade-off for your classification task right you can't select a model that has a 100 percent true positive rate because then it would also have a very high, almost 100% false positive rate, which you don't want. You want the model that has the highest possible true positive rate while keeping the false positive rate as low as possible. So ideally, the false positive rate would have to be zero, but then you know, you'd have a very low true positive rate as well. So you have to find the balance, you have to find the trade-off, and a very good way to do this is to, by plotting this and, and picking the top, you know, further top left corner, furthest top left corner possible, because that is the ideal point here, uh, where your true positive rate is as maximized as possible while keeping the false positive rate at a relatively low value. So this is also important for you to understand this trade-off. So take your time, right? Pause the video and take your time to understand this relationship. Now the dotted line corresponds to our classifier that randomly guesses so if you just have a classifier that randomly guesses you know just flips a coin and, and predicts if it's false or positive this would be the roc curve of, of such a classifier and so the better the classifier the further up into the left corner this elbow goes into so you can have a classifier that's less good right and it would maybe have a curve like this so you know you want it to be above this line because otherwise your model is no better than flipping a coin but the more pronounced this elbow is or this corner is the better your model because the higher the true positive rate you can achieve with a lower false positive rate now this is a good way to show what i was trying to explain so this is the random classifier here and ideally, right, you want a, a model with a zero false positive rate and a 100% true positive rate. And that would correspond to this point here. But, right, in practice, that's impossible. So you can try and get as close as possible to that corner, but there's always going to be a curve here. So you pick the point that's closest to it. And then, you know, you might have different models that are worse, right? They get further and further away from this perfect classifier here. And a good way to, sum, you know, instead of having to always plot this and find the spot and then find the corresponding value 
and then get the th threshold for it, etc. We can use a metric called the AUC or the area under the curve. And so ideally speaking, if you know how to measure the area of a triangle, you would know that this triangle, you know, assuming that the curve is, goes straight down from here and straight over here, the area under it would be one. So that would mean that the perfect classifier would have an area under its curve corresponding to one. Now the random classifier has a zero area. It's just a line. There's no triangle, right? Now, as the model gets better, the area under its curve increases. So the perfect classifier would be one and the random classifier would be 0 0.5. Okay. So the worst model you can ever have that's even worse than a random classifier would be zero. So you want to have a model that has an AUC that's higher than 0 0.5, right? Because the closer it is to 0 0.5, the more similar it is to just a random classifier. And ideally, you want it to be one. So anything between, so generally, we say that like, you know, 0 0.7 is good, 0 0.8 is really good. You know, you, you don't want to be close to 0 0.5. You don't want you know, 0 0.6 is not really that good, but it's still better than a random classifier. So try to, the higher the AUC, the better your classifier is. Now, multi-class classification can distinguish between more than two classes, as we said, you know, as opposed to binary classification, which distinguishes between two classes. And some algorithms such as random forest classifiers, which we will learn about in this course, are capable of handling mul multiple classes directly. So random forests are really amazing. You can do regression with them. You can do classification with them. You can do multi-classification with them. So we're definitely going to be learning ab about them. And, you know, they're very useful and almost any type of problem you might encounter. Other algorithms such as support vector machine classifiers, which we will also learn about in this course, or linear classifiers are strictly binary classifiers, okay? Now, various strategies exist to perform multi-class classifications. And I mentioned this briefly in the beginning of this video. And They use multiple binary classifiers. So there are two ways to do this. I'm sure there are others as well, but these are the, the two you know, main ones. You know, one versus all, abbreviated as OVA. And we also have one versus one or OVO. So... I'm not going to be going into those, but know that they exist. And if you are interested, you can go and, and learn about them as well. And these are my references for preparing this slide or this presentation. If you want to check them out, and these are actually the, the, the slides that I, I you know, I, I used in, in college in, for my course that I was talking about, right? And yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.